Hi, and welcome to Ask GMBN Tech. I um, can't believe I'm saying this, but this is the 230th show of this. Uh, seems pretty wild, doesn't it? Uh, if you've got any questions relating mountain bike tech, please get involved in the comments under there. It could be about tuning your gears, it could be about an old bike you always wanted to know about, it could be about alloy, carbon, you name it, whatever it is, get involved, use the hashtag Ask GMBN Tech. And whilst you're at it, if you don't already subscribe to GMBN Tech, Give us a bit of love, subscribe to the channel, give us a thumbs up, tell your friends about us. It's free content four times a week coming at you. So first question this week is from Tim Sadler, which always pleases me when I see Tim in the comments actually, because he's, he's a regular on the channel, which is great. He says, it's 2023, we're hearing about overstock in warehouses as we try and reach a balance of supply and demand post pandemic. Second hand bike prices are also dropping, yet we're still hearing about brands that have long lead times on certain parts to finish their bikes. So with that in mind, and you're lucky enough to have three grand, which is what, 3,400 euros and probably not far off that in US dollars, in your pocket for an everyday trail mountain bike, do you buy a complete bike? Do you buy a second hand or do you try and source everything separately, combining the best of all options there? Um, well, it's funny because I filmed a dirt shed with Martin Ashton and special guest Sandy Plenty recently, and also we did a podcast all about it. Uh, that podcast is hopefully gonna be flying around down there underneath somewhere. Now, we were chatting about this exact thing, we rabbited on for about an hour about it, because it's actually a pretty deep conversation, but the quick version of what happened, in, pay, in case you don't know, is pre-pandemic, so 2019 you're talking, bike industry ticking along, doing its usual thing. Of course, there would have been ups and downs. Uh, but when, uh, when COVID hit and factories started closing down, obviously some factories continued, but supply chains started struggling because of what was going on in the world. And now this could have meant that an entire fleet of bikes was nearly ready to leave a factory, but they were missing perhaps, I don't know, like the crown race for the fork. So they couldn't assemble that one part of the bike. So those bikes were stuck there, they couldn't be shipped. The dealers couldn't get the bikes. Um, back in home countries, wherever that was. So the whole supply demand thing went crazy. So we were advising people, if you see a bike and you like it, just buy it, because you're not gonna see another one. And this happened for a lot of the world for a long time, uh, until what's finally happened is almost the opposite has ended up happening. So you're getting bike shops starting to over order because they're panicking that they're not gonna get enough stuff. Now the sort of the floodgates have opened, everyone's got loads of stock and it's a bit of a problem. Uh, well, certainly a short-term problem for the bike industry, it might last a couple of years, you know, um, but no doubt it is a big problem for them. But that also means great news for you lot because you're gonna be able to get bargains at the moment. Now, yes, this sucks if you're trying to sell a second-hand bike because you've got to really want to get rid of that bike because you're gonna to have to drop the money for someone to want to buy it, unfortunately, at the moment. Um, or you're gonna keep hold of that bike, but it does mean brand new bikes, you're gonna be seeing some amazing, I'm talking ridiculous deals. You're never gonna see deals this good again on brand new bikes. So I, I would do that because you're gonna get components on a bike, it's always gonna be cheaper to do it like that than it is to buy them individually. Uh, of course, making repairs, you're just gonna buy a certain thing. But yeah, I'd go for the complete bike. You're gonna get a warranty on it, even if it's a last year bike, and you're gonna get a brand new one at the same time. Um, pretty crazy, but check out that podcast, have a listen on that, some interesting stuff, and let Martin Ashton know uh, what you think, if there's more things like that you want us to chat about. It's a, it's a good one, I think. Uh, next up from Marco. Is it normal for mechanical dropper posts, ah, blah, is it normal for mechanical dropper posts to have a harder to push um, when the drop post is weighted. I notice my drop post is easier to push the lever when I'm standing. Okay, right, so there's a, a few things going on here. Um, I'm guessing what you mean is when you're sat on a saddle and you're pushing, like engaging the, the drop ready for it to go down, is kind of a little bit of resistance before it goes, almost like you have to wiggle it a bit, is that right? Um, if that's the case, um, it could be down to the nature of your particular post. Some mechanical posts are literally like a, a key in a hole style system. And by engaging the lever, what you're doing is you're pulling the key out of the hole, enabling it to drop up and down. Uh, some, of course, are pneumatic. You're using an air spring in there. They work a little bit differently. Um, they all vary slightly. But if it is one of the mechanical ones and it has that, you might literally just have to just have a little wiggle on the saddle as you engage that. And then, of course, the other option is your drop post might need repairing. Um, it could be just a little bit worn out, and you'll see this more notably on the longer travel options. If you've got a post with about 175 mil drop, you've got a lot of exposed seat posts that have been supported uh, down the bottom there. Now, the way that most drop posts work is you've got grooves on the inside. It could be three grooves, and you'll have three keys that correlate to them. When those keys get worn, you get a bit of movement like this, but you also get a bit of movement all around them. Uh, things can catch. Now, those keys are designed to wear. They're made from a softer material than the rest of the posts. And the idea is if you have a massive crash and your saddle flicks to the side, 
it's just those keys that are going to get damaged and they tend to be made from brass or other soft materials. Um, so check with your local bike shop, they normally do a service pack or better still, get them to service it for you. Um, next up is from Mar Crow. Um, when installing a new fork, is there a good way to calculate how much steering tube I should have, as in a space between a headset and a stem for my height and reach? Well, first up, that is really down to personal preference. It's very different in the world of mountain biking to what it is in road cycling. Road cycling bike fit is crucial to both like being efficient on the bike and also to resist injury because you're mainly seated in the same position for extended periods of time. Mountain biking, there is an element of that, especially in cross country, but for the most part, it's all about the dynamic handling of the bike and that is down to the beholder, really. So what, you're, what you prefer. Now, if you had a fork on the bike previously and it felt good, then the obvious thing to do is to measure the tube on there and go like for like. If you haven't, then what I would suggest is doing a dry installation. So don't chop anything down and don't bother using any grease. Put the fork on the bike, put the stem on the bike, hopefully with a number of spacers below it and a few above it. And then literally you're gonna have to sit on the bike and try and figure out roughly where you like it. Now the best bit of advice is to leave it perhaps two spacers, like two 10 mil spacers um, too long. Cause you can always trim that down, but you'll never get it back. You're much better off having a bit more steer tube and then trimming it down than regretting it and going too short. So the best bit of advice would be sort of trim it uh, with enough room to allow for perhaps 20 to 30 millimeters of worth of spaces above the stem. So then you can tailor the height and just ride it, get to know it. You'll soon figure out what feels right and then you can commit and trim it down a bit more. And don't worry, the star nut that goes inside the steer tube, you can continue to knock it down to compensate for that. You'll obviously never knock it out that way, but you can keep tapping it in. Uh, that's my best advice for that. Next up from Tom Short. Hey, Anna and Doddy, I'm considering a SRAM dub crank set and was wondering, will it work with my GXP bottom bracket? Uh, will it swap right in or do I need, do I need a new B, uh, BB? Uh, I can do all this myself, so I'll watch your show. Okay, so dub is, the axle is 28.99 millimeters, whereas GXP is 24 millimeters. Uh, so obviously they're not compatible. Um, really, you're gonna need a new bottom bracket on the bike. Now, when you buy dub cranks, they don't come with a bottom bracket because you obviously have the freedom of choice to pick whether yours is a press fit or a BSA screw in one or whatever it is. So you'll just need to buy a new BB. Um, yeah, that's it, really. Uh, good luck. Uh, next up from Daniel Pamp. Regarding today's discussion about pedal kickback, I don't know when this was pasted into here, so we'll just have to pick this up. If you have a full suspension bike and you use the suspension a lot and you've put in brackets downhill, it should be better than to have a low engagement hub to make the drivetrain last longer or... Um, okay, so are you worried about high engagement hub wearing out your transmission? If you are, then I don't see how it would make any, any difference to wear on the drivetrain, if I'm honest. Um, you could definitely feel a high engagement hub if your bike has a lot of chain growth on there. And some riders will be put off by that and some won't. Hence you're seeing some people trying to choose hubs that have got a bit of delay in the pickup there. Uh, but then of course there's positives to a hub that's got a lot of pickup in it because it feels really responsive to how you want to ride. So there's elements of the bike design there and what you want as a rider. I did make a video, I think I called it like, um, it was like a stripping down a super hub, something like that. I had one of the Industry 9 hubs, we took it apart and explained how it worked and why you'd want to consider something. And I did reference a lot of that in there. So uh, that Industry 9 wheel video will be in the description underneath and hopefully that will give you a bit of understanding about if you want one or if you don't want one. But I wouldn't be concerned about it wearing anything out. Um, as long as you maintain everything on your bike as you would normally, it should be fine. Uh, next up, is it okay to set up my 2001 Diamondback mullet setup, i.e. with 26 inch wheel rear and 29 on the front. Um, I probably wouldn't do it to be fair. If it's a 26 inch wheel bike from, from that long ago, to make it mullet setup, uh, if in case you don't know what mullet is, it's a smaller back wheel than the front wheel essentially. Um, to try and get the bike even vaguely balanced, you'll have to pick a shorter travel fork, but in a 29 inch compatibility, uh, in order to put that 29 inch wheel on the bike. So you'll be losing out suspension travel on the front. It's still gonna be higher than before. Because of your bike being a 26 inch wheel bike, if you put a 29 on the front, you're gonna probably get some toe overlap. Um, so you get this on road bikes, but you don't tend to get it on off-road bikes. So with your right foot forwards, for example, if you turn the bars to the left, there's a good chance that the wheel will actually hit your, your toe on your right foot. Um, I wouldn't bother doing it, to be fair. You could do it with 27 and a half. That would probably, you'd probably get away with that. Um, but to be honest, what's wrong with 26? 
I mean, I know it's not as common these days, but there's nothing wrong with it. Just enjoy what you've got. Uh, next up from Francis D. Are different suspension systems applying a different amount of stress to the bearings? Are some suspension systems better when it comes to bearing longevity? Uh, the question was just popping up in my head. Uh, yeah, essentially, um, I mean, there's loads of different types of different bearings, but the main ones you tend to see on bikes are um, solid bearings, also known as bushings. So like a DU bushing that you can see in a shock, for example, at either end, uh, kind of a milky color. In fact, if I've got one here, I can show you. There we go. That's okay. That's a DU bushing. Uh, you get these made by Igus and various other companies. And then you obviously get bearings as well. In fact, I've got one, one of these I can show you. Now it's got a bearing in there, but no, this one's got a bushing at one end and a bearing at the other end. Now, of course, this will be the same on the pivots on a bike. Now, what bearings are really good at is lots of rotation. And what they're not good at is not much rotation. These ones can do either, but you could say that arguably there's a little bit more friction in them. They're slightly tighter to fit and they're designed to wear out um, saving the other components. So they both have advantages. But where these are exceptionally good is on a bike design. If a linkage, for example, let's just say the one by the bottom bracket, it doesn't move much really on the grand scheme of things. A bushing is actually going to be better for that because of it. It's designed to handle that load a bit better. Whereas a bearing, although it's going to feel more active just because of the nature of a bearing, if you're just moving it a small amount, it's going to get notchy really quickly. Uh, and you will see that on certain bike designs. So uh, it's also why, off the top of my head, Ibis use bearings on their rockers and stuff that move loads, but on the on the ones that don't move as much, they use bushings. So they're trying to do a hybrid back end. So it does vary. And I've been asked this quite a lot actually about the difference between bearings and bushings and where they're used on a bike. So uh, I've actually got a load of stuff coming from Igus who make a lot of those DU style bushings. Um, and we're gonna basically have a look at them all and explain where you would see them on a bike and why versus bearings. Kind of like an explainer. And that's coming up soon on the channel. And lastly this week from Levi, says I've got a 2016 Kona Process 153 and I'm debating stripping it down to raw alloy. Um, any tips or processes that I should follow? Uh, I don't wanna wreck the frame structurally, but also love the look of raw alloy. Uh, now I actually spoke to Toff, super sick Toff from uh, who does stuff for the Dirt Shed about this because he's done this loads. Now he says he used to use nitro mores, but it's quite powerful and it can be quite nasty stuff to deal with as well. And what he said is a water-based paint stripper um, tends to be rinsed off more easily. And I think that's part of the key here. And something he suggested was roughing up the frame tubes, which makes sense because the, the paint stripper can get onto the tubes. And he said, soak up kitchen towel, uh, particularly kitchen towel, uh, obviously be using rubber gloves and any sort of respirators and stuff that you need to for this when you're doing it. Um, and wrap that kitchen towel around the tubes and then wrap it in cling film, basically. So the cling film keeps it from drying out and allows it to do its job. And then apparently when you go to peel it off again after the required amount of time, um, the paint literally just comes off. But then what you're gonna need to do is keep on top of your polishing and stuff because raw alloy frames can get a bit tarnished over time. Now I'm sure there's loads of other ways of getting a really good finish on a bike and if anyone's done it, I'd love to hear how you've done it and in fact, how yours looks. Uh, send it to our uploader so we can have a look at it and we'll put you on top mods on the weekly show. Uh, and that's it for this week. Any more questions, get involved down there and we'll see you next time.